Hey everyone, welcome to Retire with Style. I'm Wade, I'm joined by my co-host Alex, and we're continuing the series today where we're talking to advisors who are on the front lines using the RISA as part of their practices. Today, our, our special guest that we're happy to welcome is Neil Gordon of Gordon Wealth Planning based in Rockaway, New Jersey. And we're really excited to have you on the show today, Neil, welcome. Thanks very much, Wade and, and Alex. I appreciate you having me on. Nice. Absolutely. It's it's great. Yeah, absolutely. How can we not have you on when you have those two books in the background? <laughs> there. Um, I'm waiting for Alex. I'm waiting for your book, unless you have it out and I just embarrass myself. <laughs> have me be a while. You have a Snickers? <laughs> that, 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 that may, that may be a while. Who are, <laughs> those who are listening, you've got Ed Slot's book and you've got my book uh, behind you. So thank you very much for that. No, no offense, those... but it is it is the last edition. It's not the newest edition. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I tell people if they've got the, the first edition, it's not necessary to upgrade. It's more of a, a nice to have. But uh, for those who are watching or who are able to see this, which probably <laughs> is about 1%, mostly uh, this is an audio only podcast. But if you are watching, you notice Alex is sitting in front of a purple wall today. So <laughs> Alex, where are you at? <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Well, I am from the, I, I'm from, I'm in Canada, actually, uh, in Ottawa. I'm um, here with Trevor. Trevor is our product lead for the RISA. And uh, we're working on an upcoming release. So I'm actually in an Airbnb in Ottawa, in Orleans. Or I don't know how you would pronounce that in French, <laughs> Orleans or, or whatnot. <laughs> we're here uh, crunching away. And it's the weirdest Airbnb. It's it's nice. It's clean and everything. I'm doing my best to pick up the pick the revenues back up for Airbnb. I don't know if you've been reading that. They, I think they've been slashed by fifty percent or something in some areas. But it's kind of a. I think this is the house of somebody's parents that passed away, and instead of selling it, they just kind of went to garage sales and put in kind of a mismatch of furniture. You know, it's shab the shabby chic of shabby chic. So you've got different colors everywhere and you got like, you know, just weird kind of things everywhere. But it is clean. And incidentally, wait, I brought the twins over. My kids are doing an internship yeah. with Trevor, learning how to work Figma on the back end. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. So those who follow along on, on LinkedIn have seen your twins quite a bit. And so now they're moving up and getting ready for college and doing internships. Yeah. A lot yeah, going yeah, on yeah, in the Nergia household. Bringing them into the family business a little bit, learning how to code, if you will. Trevor's got them. For, I, I, what was they doing? Yeah, they were doing something yesterday, and today they're creating all the component parts. So, like all the buttons and everything like that, they're recreating them so we can scale them out when we make changes. But that's yeah, pretty cool. They're getting a kick out of it, yeah. man. Alex, for tax purposes, are are, are these paid internships? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, how's New Jersey? Yeah. <laughs> how's Exit Zero? How's Exit Zero? What? Your kids don't listen to the podcast, do they? I don't think so. No, no, one does. no, 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 no. Well, one of yours did give you a good review on Apple Podcasts. One well, that's right. That's right. I you should have seen me. We, I kind of only we were at a, we were at a state we were at a dinner, right? And uh, Wade started like throwing some reviews my way, saying, hey, "Have you checked out our reviews?" And they were just vicious. In terms of myself, you know, the, the theme is more, more weight, less Alex, you know, that kind of, thing. so whatever. Right? <laughs> and so we're at the restaurant and we, I started reading them to them and they were just like on the floor laughing. They couldn't believe it. <laughs> Saying, oh my God, <laughs> you, you suck, pop. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then a few days later, Wade notices a review from what was the name? Ander Commander or something like yeah, that. Andrew, One of my kids Andrew is called Ander. So Ander Commander saying, <laughs> Ben, that Alex boy, he's he's great. <laughs> Something like yeah, that. Yeah, Alex's jokes have me on the rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the the brutal honesty of kids. It's great. No, no, no. So, but yeah, wait. I'm in uh, in Ottawa here. So yeah, not bad. It's great. Great. We'll go to the Redoux Canal on Friday, and uh, bike up and down that thing. It's nice. It's a good little adventure to us. But enough about us. This is about Neil, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for joining, Neil. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'll, if it's about me, let me turn it back on to you guys. So, Wade, you don't know, Alex and I have discussed some common heritage, um, shared background, uh, yeah. both growing up in Florida and then uh, ending up at school in, in Washington, D.C. 
um, Alex at GW probably a little more diligent than I was at American University, but still we're here. And then, wait, I found some some points of commonality for us. Um, you're a wrestling fan from from way back, it sounds like. Yeah, and yeah. and so am I. Unfortunately, having about ten years on both of you, um, most of the people I followed have expired. They're no longer with us. So that's they're they're more in the Hall of Fame, and there are only pictures of them. They're not around anymore. And then the other part, I heard you uh, were a ham radio and, and shortwave aficionado, and yeah, that's uh, right. Something I grew up with with my father who had a, a shortwave radio, and I was fascinated with it that you could hear things from around the world that it was just one of the great memories of, of uh, my childhood. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, absolutely. And that's with the Internet now. It's kind of taken away some of the magic. And, and I, sometimes I still turn on the shortwave radio. There's not a whole lot left to listen to anymore. But no, absolutely. When, when you're a kid able to tune in to stations all around the world. It's it's quite an amazing it, experience. It was fascinating. Yep. Absolutely. Wait, was there a, was or, or Neil, was there a special station out of, you know, whatever parts unknown that, that, that no, that was your no, favorite? it's just, it, it, you could just hear news from around the world. What was going on? It was at 12 years old. I was fascinated that I could be listening to somebody at night while it's daytime. And, and by the way, I was working as at my father's office, and this was how I spent my time. So, um, you know, <laughs> uh, it was an education, not not in his law practice at that point. I think my kids are on the shortwave radio right now, not doing any work. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how that you works. Just an aside, Wade. What you're into this one? What would happen in communist countries, or you just can't have a shortwave radio, especially like in the '80s? Well, right, it could be contraband and that's in many cases the only way to listen to the outside world was with a shortwave radio so but you might have to be sneaky about it i suppose with if government officials knew you had it they might not be happy they they used to have to hide the antennas as well it was almost like hogan's heroes it, they literally had to hide the antennas that would pick up the signals well i know nothing about that <laughs> <laughs> da -da. there you go so why are we here today, Wade? What do we have? What do we have on tap with, with Neil? You got some questions for him? Yeah, let's kind of, Neil, come up to the present a bit more. If you could just begin by telling us a little bit about your practice and and what brought you into to thinking about using the Reese as a tool, how it connects to your broader practice in general. Absolutely. Well, Gordon Wealth Planning. So I, I started out about 14 years ago as a second career. And this was still at a point where I didn't know much about financial planning or anything, but it was, all right, get licensed. It was much more of a relationship business than it was commission business, even in 2009, 2009 and it continues to evolve so. Um, but as I kept finding out, you were selling product, whether it was a mutual fund, a managed account, a model, whatever it was, it was still selling a product. So. Whatever your best model was, as they say, if you sell nails, everybody looks like looks like the hammer. Or did I get that right, uh, backwards? Ah, same thing. I, I, you, I, you, you get it. I, I, I think it becomes that, yeah. those kind of phrases become sonic wallpaper. And so yes. <laughs> it just kind of worked. Well, but it, for people well, who are then. listening in, when you say sell products, because this is one of these phrases that within the industry is kind of, you know, odd, right? What, what would you explain to the consumer what that is? Because I think it's beyond just, because you also said model portfolios. And I think at this point, model portfolios, the way they're packaged, you know, for, from a back office standpoint for an advisor are pretty much productized as well. I don't, I don't think anything escapes that phrase. And so, I don't know, I'm just going with it, but you know, selling product, what, what would, how would you describe that to your neighbor? Well, that was still, uh, somebody would ask, uh, what kind of investment should I have? Or how do I make money? And you weren't answering the question. You were just giving them whatever vehicle you had. And it could have been an annuity or something else. But you were you, you were providing that item that supposedly fit, in a general sense, uh, the goal. It was suitable, as they said. And now we've moved on to the best interest rules. Where What I found was I didn't have to ask what things were important to them. 
where they were trying to go, what the goals were. You weren't required to ask it. It started helping. And why do you want that? Why do you, it, it's like almost asking when you go into a doctor for a prescription. Well, the doctor's going to say, what, what do you, what's the problem here first before he starts handing out the pills, at least hopefully. So I, I put it in those kind of terms where, yes, we've got a lot of tools in the tool bag. And if you just go out as a tool salesman, um, you're not fitting it around the ultimate goals. And that's why the evolution in my background, my, my practice towards financial planning and then implementing the plan really was um, kind of the, the place I wanted to end up and where, where I'm at currently of trying to really get to understand and figure out why somebody wants what they want and where they're really trying to go. Because many times they can't even answer that question themselves. Most people can't. And the RISA fit in because it just provided one better structured tool for us to get to that kind of answer. And so it's that evolution from you, the term selling product is more just, okay, this is what we have here versus financial planning or building a financial uh, plan or thinking before we get to the idea of what products to use, you're looking at the overall financial picture to understand where these products can fit and what might fit in a better and what might work better to achieve the goals, like a goals-based type planning. Absolutely. And, and I'm trying to, figure out the right ways to extend this because I get involved in everything from estate planning, tax optimization, the, the, the full gamut, we call it comprehensive or holistic planning and a lot of words, which even again, custom, the, the clients don't understand these words, what they really mean. So there's a lot of, a lot of education that goes into it, but you know, we've, as an industry gone from what's your magic number, Prudential got that retirement red zone. What do you need? How much do you need to retire? great into the phase where we're at now in a lot of ways of retirement looks like this and you have to account for these different factors. So we're going to take you there, but I'm really trying to figure out ways. And there are a lot of different avenues and, and resources out there for life planning. Cause once they have enough money, once you've given them the protection, once they've got their estate plan, they're protected, they've got their growth, they've got their income plan. These plans are in place. Then what, how do they be retired? How do they be old? How do you live a life of, you know, some dignity, which is very hard these days as the older you get and the more help you need and purpose and enjoying it. So once you tell somebody you have your money, then what? And they go, I, they give you a blank stare because it's not anything we've discussed and talked about societally of what is it that you're going to do because you have enough money. But you, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're speaking of a, uh, of a concept that's come up a lot lately, and you see this with this sort of this momentum building around the behavior of finance and this, the existential qualities of, of wealth. And I think you're playing with the term of, you know, funded contentment. Once you have enough that you can underwrite your retirement, you know, how do you how do you find meaning or, or something like that? You know, or, or what are ways that you can maximize that meaning? Is that where you're getting at? Well, it is, but that's the first time I've heard that, that term used. I, I, I get in, 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 I get to a point where I try to explain it first and then tell people I label it kind of life planning. Just you have theoretically this pile of paper on the table that looks green and says, in God, we trust, and you can do something with it. And besides the have crypto, to crypto changes that, by the way, no, yeah, they, they still, but they put a picture of a, a China Ibu on there or whatever the dog is, you know, um, and, and we're still wondering, uh, it's, it's about as useful in my terms as having gold in your pocket. Looks great. Wonderful. But go to Costco and you, you can't check out there. So it, it gets back to still, what are you going to do when you grow up now that you have enough money? What are all the things you want to do that you'll get satisfaction of? And, and you know, the MIT Age Lab and Stanford and Boston College and or Boston U and, and all these different places are, are looking in. What is it to be old? OK, and sometimes we have to back into it. How much money do you need to, for that? And how do you do it with some enjoyment and satisfaction? So it's it's kind of getting the concepts to people beyond. Do I have enough money and those worries themselves? 
but we have to get there first. It's still a building block of what's the plan, what's the retirement plan, what's the income plan, what are your taxes, social security, and all the other components. Sure. And how do you find the RISA playing a role in this, if, if you do? So I don't even want to lead the witness, you know, in that sense. Uh, I'm sure you do. But uh, I, what role, <laughs> from an order of operations standpoint, do you see the RISA playing in that sort of precursor to the situation you're, you were explaining? Um, well, simply how I tell people is it is an assessment tool to just help you figure out with these answers in kind of a structured way that you'll like to have the process be in one format over another. You might want to have a lot of your returns from the market and enjoy that level of of risk and reward, or you might want different things. Couples always, almost always, I don't know that I've ever had a married couple agree, which is fine, but now I've got a piece of paper that tells them I'm not the referee and we're gonna figure out a way to accommodate both of you, all right? It, oh, it got rid of that referee shirt long time ago. Um, and and it, it, it has helped just define a set of languages and concept and again, if I'm just telling them about behavioral finance and I tell them the questions, that, that, that was good and I've, I've established my own process for it, you guys did a better job of making it a, a more structured, more scientifically based process. And it, it just, it has a little more credibility than me just telling them, here's how I think you are from our conversations. Now we've got what, if it's on paper, it's called empirical data. So it, it just adds to the credence of it. That's a good point. And does it affect your philosophy about what you want to do for this client? Because there's two, there's two ways to read what you said. Okay, we just address the issues and we surface them. And just recognize, you know, there's a, there's a point of view in psychology sometimes that just recognition of something is in and of itself sort of a way forward. But is that where you leave it? Or do you also use this information to construct you know, starting points for a, a retirement income plan for folks. You take that. Oh, uh, absolutely. Now, now, before this, uh, my process still was kind of an all of the above in the tool bag. Long term care, guaranteed income, social security, pensions, everything had a slice of the pie most of the time as my starting point. And then it was a matter of how big the slices were or weren't for, for any particular client. And I sort of explained it to people more in a spectrum of from one side of guaranteed income. You could have as if you could buy as much Social Security as you could. Would you? How much would you would you want giving up that money? And when you use Social Security as opposed to the word annuity, you sort of can take that off the table a little bit when people have their negative notions about what an annuity is, because they're always wrong. <laughs> they're, you know, they're about as wrong as Ken Fish or uh, as someone who has commercials about that. And I explained it along uh, the spectrum, and I said, people are not one end or the other. They're somewhere in the middle. And what you guys actually did was you took the spectrum and turned it into four, cor four boxes because there was crossover. There is crossover to it of, you know, people like some amount of guarantees, some amount of guardrails, some amount of flooring. I mean, there's, there's so many different methodologies that we call it, and I have a feeling it's, it's a big mix. But by taking and turning it into a quadrant, you got to overlap things as opposed to my linear view of it. And it, and it kind of helped me define it a little better for people. No, that's a good point. And, and Wade, you, you say this really well sometimes. Not sometimes, you say this really well all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I should say, you sometimes, no, whatever, I'm going to mess myself up. Uh, but uh, it's usually on a, you're right about the spectrum thing. What I started thinking when you were going off of that, what the quadrants I think made Wade and I realized in a funny sort of way is that two strategies, income protection, which is safety first and commitment orientation, and total return, which is probability-based and optionality, they're, they're, there's a congruency with them. With each of the strategies have their own internal congruencies on those two factors. And you can see why they're odd. They're, they're at different spec sides of the spectrum, the strategies. But it was looking at time segmentation and income and uh, risk wrap that we came to realize that, oh, these are kind of like behavioral plays here. Right, Wade? Do you want to go into that? 
Right, because of that, the evolution of time segmentation is just a different way to behaviorally frame your investment portfolio. And <laughs> risk graph is a different way to behaviorally frame the idea of building an income floor with part of the assets and having the upside potential of another part of the assets. But but yeah, Neil, I liked how you were expressing that idea of the, the guaranteed income versus like growth. But then, and that was a, a factor that I think was clear, this idea of probability based versus safety first. But then it was this optionality versus commitment and how that entered the conversation as well that uh, had, I, I never really thought of that as that's going to be the other primary factor, but it's something that comes up a lot. And I, many advisors who are more total return oriented always talk about that optionality angle of they could never commit their client's assets to anything. They need full optionality. And as it turns out, no, there's a lot of people that actually like the idea of committing to a strategy. And, uh, and I, I would where... tell you, I, I, I agree. I would say that, and again, I, I start out with, if you could buy more pension, if you could buy more Social Security, more guaranteed income for life, would you do it? Very few say no. It's a matter of how much. Cover just your essential expenses, cover the nice to haves, cover the, you know, really aspirational stuff. And and w as advisors, we know you can't put everything, well, most people wouldn't, um, few in the industry would, but put everything into the VA or, or the, the guaranteed income because you have to have the liquidity. You have to have the backup. You have to have the growth for inflation. You can't just be in all income necessarily. So where where the time bucketing comes in, I, I tend to use buckets just in terms of it's easier for people psychologically to see a bucket of aggressive account that's small, maybe 20%, and then a bucket of an asset allocation of a 60-40, and then a bucket of liquid uh, CDs, you know, guaranteed, no risk. And I could put that into one model. And it would still come out as an asset allocation the same. But when people can see everything's doing what it's supposed to do, meeting expectations, which means not all of it's going up at the same time or down, you still have a way to show them that they're properly aligned, but they can, they can see it and feel it and not get too worried. My account isn't going up the way I expected. Well, this one is and this one isn't. And getting them to realize how they feel about it beforehand is where you get the buy-in. So that's yeah. the reason it comes right into that is just getting the buy-in because a great plan is only as good as somebody taking it off the, out of the drawer and implementing it. No, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, have you, with regards to the RISA and using it with prospects, have, have there been any aha moments from a client, from a prospect reaction when you're like, okay, I, I, I see this now. And that could be anything from somebody thought they were something or you thought they were something else and they took the RISA and they came out differently and they somehow, you or them reconcile that or like, oh, okay, let's, let's go from here. Um, not so much that way. The, the way I've seen the, the bigger sort of impact in an unexpected way is when you start going into it and explaining it beforehand, before they take it, that there's this common language that we're each going to speak and we're going to understand the concept of what that language means. All of a sudden they now have a way to express how they feel that they, they didn't before. Uh, you know, you guys have heard before and I've, I've said it as well. This is a better iteration and different, but then the risk profile questions, are you willing to lose, you know, 20% if you can make 30% and, and uh, uh, the, the only risk profile that I know, uh, as an assessment, that's good is when I get a call at 11 o'clock at night or an email saying, can't take it anymore. We've got to make a change because people don't even know their own risk profile. They, they, they give answers that they think about. Um, and at least when you have a common language for talking about how they would want their income and their retirement to look like and how they'll feel comfortable, you've started off giving them a way to think about things that they haven't had before. So that if that's your aha moment, then, then that's it. It's not so much they came out slightly differently or there because nobody yeah. comes out on one end of the, there's nobody who comes out on the lines. Everybody's in the middle somewhere or touching the middle of that fork 
four corner quadrant? I, I think that's a very wise answer. Uh, not just because you said Thank it, you. but <laughs> no, uh, it, it's, it's something Wade and I have, have sort of realized as well, Wade, and that's that how people are coming to us now speaking in these languages. I mean, speaking in this language. Wait, right? What, well, yeah, it puts that vocabulary around the conversation that it's, we talk about how when we get many emails from people asking questions. And, and of course, you have no idea, like, should, if this, should I buy this annuity? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but, but now at least they can begin preface it with, I took the RISA, I came out with these factors, this, this is my style, should I buy the annuity? Then at least, you know, a little bit more information to what well, you still have to do the financial plan, but okay, we're, we're now able to speak a common language that you have preferences that align potentially with the annuity. So at least I'm not trying to say, okay, well, your total return, wondering if you should have the annuity and so forth. So that, that is important. And, yeah, and, and you know, we have a Pygmalion in the audience looking to fix up their, 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 their language and, and the like. How can someone find out more about uh, your firm? Uh, well, that gets very easy. Um, certainly my website goes into some of the concepts we're talking about here, Of, and that's uh, NG, Wealth Planning. A little long, but uh, I could remember the NG. Um, and so it's ngwealthplanning.com. Phone number, easy to find me, is 973-291-2800. And on the website is a, my calendar link uh, so that if somebody wants to set up a, a, a just a, as we call it, a discovery call. And I wish you guys could come up with a better word than that. Uh, but it's just to get to know people, answer some questions. Uh, people always wonder if I'm charging just for that. No, the, the, you, until you ever know that you can help somebody, that they want your help, and you've decided the price for that help is what they're willing to to uh, or they're willing to pay that. Then uh, no, we we talk to people and, and just try to get them on the right start to getting this going. And Neil, you are you're based in Rockaway, New Jersey, but probably a, a common question since we'll have listeners all over the country is: Are there any specific geographic areas where you limit working with individuals from? Or you know, well, for country? for financial planning, no. Um, I'm licensed in uh, a number of different states because I've had clients in those states and continue to. And insurance licenses and and uh, and securities licenses are easy to get once you uh, pass the test and pay the states. So I work with people wherever because uh, it's the internet now has made this. And unfortunately, the the, the pandemic has demonstrated uh, one of the benefits is you can work with people everywhere. Uh, the process is the process. Got it. Uh, going back to the RISA, we, we spoke about the prospecting. Uh, have you used it with existing clients? And if so, at what stage do you sort of bring it up? Well, I have. Now, I've, I've had clients who, you know, for, for years have had a plan and we, we've fleshed out how to and through experience. And a lot of it is still, uh, you know, trial. I, I hate to say trial and error, but there's just the experience of, this is working, this isn't, what do we have to change? Um, and, and it's still an iterative process, even after the recent, because they'll, they'll give answers and, and things change in their lives and their feelings change. And again, couples and so forth. Um, so I have gone back with a little bit of trepidation to some to see how close I was or not. Um, and then just uh, with one that did come out, uh, not markedly different, but different enough I said, well, this is how you come out, and and we planned it this way. What changes do you want to make? How how much towards that or not? And we only made some slight adjustments um, because once I get comfortable with the different ways of doing this, sometimes it's just a matter of I think I want to be this, but they just need to to know how things react. They're they're even now I'm getting people who say we're going to be in a deep deep recession. And the clients who held in, and we made some adjustments during this past downturn and rebound, no, it's time in the market. It's don't run to one side of the boat or the other. So the idea is, when I went back to with the, the one client, he already had the experience knowing we're not getting extreme to one side or the other. And your your plan and how you're going to access 
your money and what it's going to do for you. He was very solid with that. No, that's great. No, and, and I would imagine too, was there's, I, I have to think there's an appreciation for what you did on the, from a client's point of view, because you're knee deep into a plan already that you're implementing, right? They take the RISA and caveat is the RISA is not a magic stick. I mean, it, it's just pointing out preferences and starting points for a conversation. It's no means to be this uberly prescriptive tool. It's just to kind of almost like get a heat check on things, if you will. But there has to be, I would think there's an appreciation on the client side when they're thinking that, man, I've been doing this, but Neil still has the confidence in his own self to be able to kind of do a heat check and make sure that whatever plan was in place is the one that kind of still resonates with me. And if it doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I know that there are options that are still available to implement and he's willing to consider that. I, I have to think, and maybe I'm painting too much of a primrose sort of picture here, but I have to think there is some level of appreciation and respect for bringing something like that up, even though you've already started a plan with somebody. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. That it, I'm not sure it's uh, the, the fortitude to go in and, and be called wrong, but you go in for an, uh, an evaluation and analysis during every review. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. not all of them come out good. And January reviews this year were um, <laughs> difficult. Um, and the half year reviews are great. And I tell people it's not as bad as it seems and it'll never be as good as it seems. It's going to be in the middle. Um, but they also know um, I've used three different planning software programs. I started out with Money Guide way back when, when it was basically an annuity sales tool, um, or at least that's the way uh, one of the banks utilized it. Uh, moved on to eMoney, which was great, the most powerful software tool out there in, in our industry, in my opinion, um, and and produced really wonderful 99-page plans, which, you know, everybody reads the first page and tells us what, you know, tell me what to do. Um, and now I'm on to Right Capital. So they're used to me changing technologies as the industry changes and as and and it's going at breakneck speed so just adding this as a tool wasn't some big shocker to everybody but it was different it was absolutely different and again it was as i somewhat described it it's a rorschach test for will they implement the ideas that i that i bring forth to them based on our conversations and now it's a, a scientific test if you will You can have that phrase too if you like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I'm yeah, practicing the pregnant about... pause. I'm, I'm looking at way <laughs> down. <laughs> sound bites. For, you're, you're thinking about how you're gonna get some sound bites out of the episode. Yeah, 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 no, that, yeah, that really yeah. is a Go on, great way to put it. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. I think it's fantastic. And I, I'll go into it again. One of the things, and I think I, I told you guys that uh, more of my practice is is working with women. Uh, the majority, about 55, 58 percent, which on industry average is much higher. Um, and uh, it's worked out that way just through my own background, who I've been referred to and loyal clients. But they haven't had much in general of the industry pay that much attention to them. Um, they're going to end up with, before the money goes to the next generation, they're going to end up with a majority of it first if they haven't been the ones to amass it themselves. So, uh, again, generalizing when you ask women about their feelings goes a long way. Men want to know what your return is in general. And and working with female clients, that they, they want to know how is this going to take place and how are you going to accommodate the, the way they feel, and they, they feel listened to and heard, as the, the common phrases are now. And this is just a tool that kind of proves, I want to know what they want. I, I think that's a good point. Uh, the other nuance that you have, and I would say for the other 45% of your practice, and you were alluding to couples, and how sometimes there is some sort of dissonance between them. Uh, how do you use it to maybe reconcile differing views or... And or does that actually do you win sort of I don't know credits if you will goodwill 
because it seems to us when there's a couple, at least to me, let me not speak for way, but it seems to me when there's a couple, there's usually one person that that carries the the weight of the financials, you know, within the within the household. It's not necessarily split 50-50. It's not equally weighted it's split. It's more a division of labor question where somebody handles the financials, the other person handles whatever, you know, whatever, whatever 10 things you got to kind of do within, within a marriage or a family, right? And so when you bring this up, when you give the reset to couples and their differing views, what, 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 what is your reaction? What is your style? You know, just take it away. Well, number one, throw some gasoline on that fire and, and, and let them sort of duke it out a little bit first. Try to get, facilitate the conversation that they are going to like, okay, so this is, if I hear you, this is what you want. You want that. You know, and and what adjustments? Here's what we have to work with. I, I I try to look for the middle ground, but I say we can accomplish this in a number of ways. We can separate some of the funding, and some clients, as couples, have separate funding. They keep keep their money separate and have common buckets. Some it's one bucket, and how's this going to work out? Um, it helps when you do talk about when there's age disparities, when there's health and genetic and family history disparities, who's going to live the longest? And, and nine times out of 10, it's women will, will come out that way. So trying to get them both to understand if this is the, the common way that things turn out, how do we get you both satisfied and what's the difference? And again, this one is where it comes along the spectrum. You're going to get some of a little of everything. It, it, it'll never be all of one thing ever. Has the facility, uh, the RISA help facilitate the conversation around what was maybe otherwise abstract with this idea that there are different ways to think about a retirement income plan and maybe. Oh, absolutely. The individual who was managing things never realized that the spouse might have a differing point of view. Um, usually it's not so much didn't realize it's just didn't pay attention to. Uh, and more so, um, but um, it, it, it's getting it. It's again facilitating a common language conversation. I feel this way, and here's 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 what my results say. I would like. How do we accommodate that? Why it it it, it takes me out of my opinion because they have results in front of them. They have a score. They have a dot in four squares that shows them what they want, and what they don't, and and. There, I just take over of trying to show you can have both to some degree to that you're both satisfied. You, It's not black and white. So it's not so much of a fight. It's let's talk about our areas of agreement. How do we how do we do that? And and again, it's usually going in for some combination and one party will tend to acquiesce a little more and usually again it depends on all the other factors here you have the it's really fun when you get a blended family second marriages and then different children and the reason it helps me focus the conversation of i like your kids and i don't like your kids and i, I boy those those get a little more difficult and they're so common these days um you know 25 30 percent of of the conversations I have deal with blended families and what's happened and who gets what. And I, I tend to try to put it back to the most important part, which is how are we going to make sure you have your money yeah. through the through and don't run out? The kids will be fine. Great point. Great point. Okay. Sometimes and, and it gets to it gets to that also, even um how many parents will fund their kids' life at the detriment of their own retirement. Another way to kind of help yeah, them well, stay well, away from that. What do you think? What's your what's your take on something like that? You see that a lot. Me? Yes. No. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. No. I. I. I uh, there. There's. There's many cases where I. 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 I kind of really indicate what somebody's doing with their money. And helping fund their kids, and I say I wear two hats. I'm the I'm the in, this passionate advisor, and I'm a parent. Yeah. And and it's not an easy decision. Tell your kids go 
get a job and get off the couch necessarily or whatever their issues are uh, that, that you have somebody feels the need to help them at the detriment of their own retirement. And you really have to point the numbers to that. And then when it gets to be a couple, you're really trying to find a way to walk the line in any document like the RISA, which has empirical information back to them, takes it out of, I think, into, well, here's what you've said. So it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a helpful tool that way. Now, you've, you've pointed out a couple of cues that we've heard, we've been hearing indirectly, Wade, is that it's funny, right? Because good advisors have, have a level of humility about them, right? It, it's not, they don't want their advice to sound like it's coming from the mountaintop. And that's why. You know, that kind of thing, because it just just doesn't feel right to them, I think, naturally. And so a lot of folks have pointed out that the RISA kind of provides this third party informational thing where it's like you said, it's not a matter of opinion anymore, of my opinion, Neil the Great. It's a matter of how you answer this empirically backed battery that indicates X, Y, Z. And so based on that, I'm going to take that information and give you you know, my interpretation of it, but, but it didn't, it wasn't sourced from you, from your sort of point of view. I think we get that a lot. And there's an appreciation from a certain level of advisors because it's, it provides that empirical sort of output that an advisor can point to, to help guide, you know, to help start the process. And, 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 and I think that separation of, of church and state, you know, when it comes to this mountaintop advice, I think is appreciated by by a good number of advisors. I mean, would you say, Wade, we've got in that kind of theme a lot? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wade. Man of few words. <laughs> Man of few words. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or he didn't agree with me and he's just saying, yeah, okay. Just... <laughs> well, like, Alex, is he, start, is he starting to sound like your wife? Sure, honey. Yeah, whatever you say. Yeah. <laughs> no. I gotta let Alex talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, yeah, that's been great, man. Uh, like I said, uh, I, I think this series is intended specifically for advisors like yourself. I mean, just listening to you, I don't know how somebody doesn't think, man, this guy's on it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's great. And 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 again, our thesis is the, the 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 really good advisors out there aren't the ones getting on the soapbox producing content on you know everywhere at the sacrifice of servicing clients i I think the really good advisors are the ones just doing the work you know rolling up their sleeves and doing the work and and we we just wanted to take the opportunity to give everyone to give folks like yourself the sort of platform so so people really can identify you know what how to discern good advisors from people that are just talking heads and so I, you know, I, I, you know, thank you so much for, for being on this. I re- really, really appreciate it, you know, from that vantage point. And- well, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative that you guys did come up with this. It, it seemed like somewhat self-serving to work and to use in your own practice. And then all of a sudden you figured out, you know, if it works for our clients and our prospects, maybe the rest of the world could use it. Um, I mean, financial planning is such an invasive process especially with people who really don't understand and said, well, how am I going to make it? And you're, you're trying to ask them all sorts of intimate questions. And it's not the, it's not the questions that are on the statements. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the personal questions. It's the self-reflective questions. And most people don't want to talk about that stuff. It's, it's easier to say, yeah, I've got how much in the 401k and I've got social security and how do you feel? And what was your biggest money mistake? And what were the messages you got? Again, when you when you can just put this tool in front of them and they have to think about it, but it, they're, you know, I tell people, I'm not judged. This is your money. You can spend it any way you want. I'll just tell you what happens if you do. But there, there's a non-judgmental aspect to taking this kind of, 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 assessment without it saying you're really bad with money you're really good with money it says this is how you feel you want your your money to come back to you in the form of retirement and retirement income and 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 so forth so it's very like i said it's non-judgmental it can take away that uh, uh, lower the the barriers a little bit the psychological barriers that they might have agree i know you did it no, 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 but the way you said it is kind of cool. 
you actually said it in uh when I was hearing you phrase it back, I was like, I got to remember this phrase because it, it was really uh, at, at a great level. I, it's You'll go back and watch the, the podcast again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wade, you want to take us home? Yeah, so Neil, if uh, any listeners would like to get in, in touch with you again, could you review how they can reach out and contact you? Again, my, my phone number and my text number, 973-291-2800. Uh, my website, and I'll, I'll expand the commercial, is www.ngwealthplanning.com. One of the things I'm very proud of is the fact that uh, I've put up within the last two months uh, about 89 free, non-gated, most of them, almost none of them will ask for information, different resources, um, how-to guides, checklists. Um, there's so much information, so much good commoditized information available out there. And I've just broken it down into retirement planning, income planning, estate planning. People can go in and, and I'll never know that they were there and downloaded this information. And a couple have called me based on that saying, well, if that's what you think is important, then maybe you might be able to help us out. So welcome to, to take those kind of calls. Right on. Man. Right. Great. And for any advisors listening today, if you are interested to learn more about how you can bring the RISA into your firm, Alex and I will be holding a masterclass uh, starting uh, two hours a day on August 28th, 29th. And then those are for CE credit and, and some uh, optional sessions beyond that as well. So we hope to see everyone there. Thank you again for joining us today, Neil. Thanks everyone for listening to Retire with Style and we'll catch you next week. Guys, thank you very much. Our pleasure.